Yeah. Then I'm very pleased to welcome Martin Schettinger from New York University. Uh, I was about to say a regular visitor to Orpheus, but I hope that will be the case. Uh, has been here previously to talk about political economy, about uh, digital culture, and this afternoon he's going to speak against Deleuze. No. Thank you, Dr. and thanks to everybody for on the committee to, who invited me and so on and so forth. Um, I'm probably going to be a little bit in and out of uh, my paper because I, um, it's far too sort of long, but it depends where the resonance is and there's critiques sort of that I'm trying to pepper all the way through. And I'd like to end up at a certain place, but I'm not sure if I'll, I'll get it anywhere. It's called Anti Anti-Oedipus, everything that you read in the uh, blurb about what this is, the abstract is a little off. Um, I thought we could preserve that for a conversation we're going to have after this. Um, but I'm going to keep things a little bit simple, a little bit simplistic, paint with a broad brush, you know, that also can illuminate, and make a few observations about not so much Deleuze, but the effect of Deleuze. Like, what is Deleuze? Why is he hanging around, loitering in the humanities the way he does uh, nowadays? And I'd like to just sort of reflect on that a little bit. Given that um, it seems that his work was authored at a time when social sort of exploitation or struggles against social exploitation were somehow coterminous or allied with um, <coughs> psychic, rep psychic repression, right? So libidinal energies and class struggle had some kind of relationship to each other. We're talking about, you know, 60s, 70s, and then into this explosion of the two books, the Anti-Oedipus and then the <coughs> Thousand Plateaus. Um, and uh, his strength was to synthesize these seemingly independent productive spheres and circuits and so on into desiring machines, amalgamations on planes of consistency and so on and so forth, what we've heard about a lot. But why now? Why are we so interested in this now? When it is no longer obvious, to me anyway, that um, libidinal uh, energies or sexual revolutions and so on are productive anti-capitalist forces. It is no longer obvious to me. And that, in fact, it might be the case that libidinal intensities do less to undermine than to underwrite uh, certain sort of capitalist flows today. Okay, so I'm trying to say that it's possible that it, in fact, intensifies the very enemy it seeks to undo. Um, so, I might be wrong, okay, but it is true, for example, that desiring production in Antiedipus almost reads like a thick description of contemporary networked habitat which produce affect as a kind of binding technique, layering and in interconnecting endless communicative platforms and devices. I'm thinking about the way we interact today. And there are digital traces of it. If I read this little passage <coughs> and it could just be a description of online behavior. A connection with another machine is always established along a transverse path so that one machine interrupts the current of the other or sees its own current interrupted. Producing is always something grafted onto the product, and for that reason, desiring production is production of production, just as every machine is a machine connected to another machine, and so on and so forth. Right? And given that it's traceable now digital, what was always probably already the case, um, it does it not testify to the value of Deleuze's analytics today? Heterogeneous chains of desiring production, again in quotes. Um, and couldn't one say that it is also to some extent tethered, or there's a connection to the anti-exploitative, non-proprietary ethos of volunteer production that seems to, against all econom economic odds, to have emerged. The mashups, the remixes, the wikis, the uploads, the tweets, the petitions, the collaborative projects from Wikipedia to NASA click workers to free software movement, and on and on and on. Is there a potential that this is in fact an incarnation of that very Deleuzean idea? Um, and that the way in which new efficiencies in digital distribution and search functionality, along with globally oriented peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, has ushered in an era that might be described as widespread collaborative volunteerism, decentralized, disintermediated, and arguably democratic, or something like that. Okay. And is the subjectivization process, in other words, how, what do subjects, what, under, what, how does the subject undergo metamorphosis under these technical conditions? Um, is it not the opposite of what all of our media theorists have been saying, especially the Marxist inflected ones, Adorno with his pseudo, um, the pseudo individual, standardized and so on, Foucault with his disciplined subject, Althusser, interpolation and so on and so forth. Is it not, in some sense, 
the opposite of uh, that. Um, and Or even the more recent ones, people like Sherry Turkle, who will say we've become customized subjects, um, balkanized in some ways with weak egos, distracted, interactive, and so on. Or somebody like Nicholas Carr, again a more popular uh, theorist, saying that we've become balkanized according to narrow viewpoints that are hitched to bands of search, and so on and so forth. No, I don't think that is the case. Okay? I think it is the opposite. Okay? What we find here is a ballooning of desire, whether socially sanctioned or not, or not. An inverted self where every obsession, fixation, paranoid theory or perverse one, every fetish and dream is externalized. Whether we want to see Saddam Hussein's dead body, whether we want to see hot tight Swedish air hostesses doing something crazy, or whether we want to look up the next song or the definition of the id itself, it seems to me that it is all instantly and externally available. And is this not the ego annulled? A rapacious self shattering all the networks of collectivity and endlessly forging new ones, capriciously ballooning and contracting identities, rapacious rhizomes of production, erratic self-renewal, desiring machines, a literalization, one might say, of the subject of anti-Oedipus itself. Okay, so the two major concepts that were handed down to us media people from Deleuze are assemblage on the one hand and affect on the other. Not by any means identical, but they do bear some relation. I'm not going to talk about assemblage, but we can mention people like Delanda uh, coming out of De uh, Deleuze's transcendental empiricism. We can mention people like T Latour with his actor networks. Um, which are proliferated hybrid planes of imminence, where ever incomplete forces and vectors and so on um, intersect with each other. And he's very interested also in non-human actors. This is the great achievement of Latour. And who wouldn't be in our time? They become exacerbated at a micro temporal level and a macro temporal level. Who is no longer? Who can talk about you know micro timing of high frequency trades and so on and so forth, or uh, the timing of the well, what a clue bot does in Wikipedia, which makes your entry redundant and therefore acceptable or not? This is all happening at micro and milliseconds and nanoseconds, and you know. There's wires being stretched across the world of fiber optics to ensure that that happens at ever quicker paces. We need to think under no our own sort of notions of temporality. And on the other hand, who would want to ignore the great ecological and so on changes, eco eco uh, ecological catastrophe, etc., which is going at a glacial pace, and therefore unable to be reckoned with in a more seductive kind of ordinary um, set of data for the human sensorium and so on. So there's a lot to be said for why these assemblage and network uh, people are alive and well today. We can also mention the object-oriented ontologists, the speculative realists and so on, more or less in that camp. But let's not talk about assemblage because I want to talk about affect. Because that's what music, where music and sound seems to play a particularly privileged role. Again, questionably, but it does so. Okay, And coming out of this desiring production, we get a new interest today in what is called pre-personal intensity, or affect, immediacy, epiphany, day excess, the drastic as against the Gnostic, presence culture as against meaning culture, and so on. Okay? It is as if we have left the system that was once called linguistic and turned towards affect, away from deconstruction, etc., away from signifying systems, all so much blah, blah, blah. Who are you? And he 
Great Center. Now, I am the soul. And you know, language is a virus from outer space. And hearing your name is better than seeing. So, language, a virus from outer space, uh, you know, the linguistic term, external, a surrogate, a substitute, exploitative, uh, a dangerous, <coughs> viral, etc. And instead, uh, hearing your voice, uh, hearing your uh, name, the ear over the eye and so on is better than seeing your face. We're back to Brian's territory. Okay? Uh, and the sound power hearing has been prior. Uh, to something else, back to Plato, you know, the soul doctor, the ensouled speech as opposed to dead letter and so on, you know, uh, the differential structure of our hold on presence, which was deconstruction, I forget all of that, <coughs> because there's some phenomena that are just too sheer, too pre-personal, too intense to be sort of uh, brought into the lobster pincer of, uh, um, of, of um, discourse analysis and so on and so forth. Um, at any rate, there's, in music, you know, tons of stuff is now being written that is in the Deleuzean spirit. Like David Toop's, like, Oceans of Sounds, John Goodman's, you know, Sonic Warfare Code 9, he's a DJ, so he had a certain personality that made this a bit more popular than, than it should have been. But it's a book that where he talks about the world as generalized ontology of vibrational force and so on and so forth, and everything is warfare. As soon as it's actualized, it becomes kind of dangerous, territor territorial, etc. Once it's in the, in the, 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 the virtual, the deterritorialized, the incipient, the potential, that's the place that he uh, wants us to, to, to remember, and so on and so forth. Well, it reminds me sort of of like, you know, Plato him, himself, or actually uh, Jesus, or, or, or Christianity, right? Everything down here is so, so bad, but up there, up there, okay? It's different, because it's imminent, but the imminent is able to totalize in a way that, you know, Christianity uh, might, have, might be meeting its match. At any rate, um, so the three important figures I want to talk about uh, are Masumi, Gumbrecht, and uh, Carolina Abate. And I mention them because they're in different fields. Masumi is a kind of political economist who wrote about affect, the autonomy of affect in Parables of the Virtual in 2002. Gumbrecht, 2003, a literary theorist, Production of Presence was the name of his book. And then Abate wrote a sort of paradigm-changing book, uh, an article in Critical Inquiry called Music? Drastic or Gnostic? And the answer is drastic. Okay? Uh, drastic being not knowledge-based, not hermeneutic, and so on. Um, and as it was for Deleuze himself, music plays a prominent role in all three of these people's sort of imagining, imagining when they think through notions of day access, presence, epiphany, etc., as well as affect. And that's, that's interesting, because why is music being construed as primarily affectual in 2004, at the very dawn of Web 2.0? At the very moment that the MP3 has unleashed the commodity form into its non-commodity, at the very moment when the debased, horrible, rationalized, segmented unit that is music of capital suddenly becomes, by commodity inversion, the inside out of the commodity. It is suddenly the free circulating thing. And what did Clear Channel, who was the biggest uh, monopoly uh, radio owner do in 2003, they started to sell off their assets. Where did they go? They bought up Ticketmaster and Live Nation, a new amalgamation. Ticket prices went through the roof. You now paid, instead of $100 to go see Madonna, you had to pay $300 to pay. This was the sort of incredible boost. Why? Because experience and effort was where it was all at. Okay, so capital was invested actively in promoting what we then in the humanities quickly like, took up and said, yeah, at, okay? And this is a very important first little moment of intervention when I'm like, wait a minute, what is going on here? How in the university are we marching in step with the ideological demands of a particular moment of commodity production, this time as experience, and the commodity in the meantime has gone free? So I just want to take note um, of that problem first of all. But maybe things are more complex, so let's look a little bit more closely at Gumbrecht. I'll go just very quickly, I'm hoping some of you read these basic texts so we can sort of push back in and out of them quickly. Uh, but Gumbrecht, in Productions of Presence, which owes a debt to Heidegger, um, speaks about presence as not the sort of ordinary mode of communication that is meaning-derived, uh, you know, parcels of symbols transmitted uh, 
uh, by movements of their mind with attributions of meaning, this horrible Cartesian, you know. But rather material processes that are somehow immediate, like they are like ballistics, a kind of intensity that brings in front of, like a tangible experience within reach, like an aesthetic experience, possibly like transfiguring the commonplace, okay, which I use this old fashioned theory of art because I think this is actually what's informing these re educated people. Um, so, and the examples he draws on are mainly music and sport, and I think that that is fascinating. So let me try to give you an example of the, of the music and sport uh, thing. Here's, here's Gumbrecht on music. I wanted my students to know the almost excessive, exuberant sweetness that sometimes overcomes me when a Mozart aria grows in polyphonic complexity, and when I indeed believe that I can hear the notes of the oboe on my skin. Okay, I think people like skin. Okay, it's a quick, it's quicker. They say it in there. Yeah. Or the joy that Gumbrek feels when the quarterback of my favorite college team in American football, X team, of course, stretches out his perfectly sculpted arms to celebrate a touchdown pass, the sudden very deep breathing and the embarrassingly wet eyes in which I must have reacted to, to that very beautifully executed pass and to the swift movement of the wide receiver who caught it. Okay? Or the glimpse, of, oh sorry, the glimpse of that illusion, the glimpse of that illusion of lethal empowerment and violence as if I were an ancient god when the bullfighter's sword silently cuts through the body of the bull and the bull's muscles seem to stiffen for a moment. Okay? There's a long tradition of writing sport in this way. Um, so, you know, somebody like David Foster Wallace is, is known for this. Um, he talks about Federer moments, as in Roger Federer. Um, and draw, draws attention to these jaw-dropping, eye-protruding moments of sheer presence that surely no deconstructivist can deal with. Okay? And such as a forehand, like a grand liquid whip, or a backhand that is multi-dimensional, can be flat, driven hard, or loaded with topspin, or sliced in three different ways so that the ball turns shapes in the air and then skids on the grass at ankle height and so on. Okay? And this other world, the ineffable, non-capturable, ordinary discourse, cannot be televised, there's often a sort of moment of technophobia in this, it cannot really, you know, Nevada has it also, it has to happen in the life. Um, uh, another, it's neither, neither here nor there, but it's, it's noteworthy for the slight bias that's going on here, not because it really matters, maybe it's fully technologically possible and so on, maybe even enhanced and so on, but these reflexes, according to, um, according to Gumbrecht and so on, cannot be televised because of the speed and reaction, the muscle reflex, the sheer intensity, which you have to sort of have that kinesthetic empathy of seeing it right there, you see yourself in the, kind of, you know, and so on, in the, in the sports person. So Wallace describes this particular moment here as, uh, in Federer as a point, this was 2006, Federer is playing Nadal, and how he manages, and it's, it's perfectly executed actually, how he manages to slowly hypnotize Nadal into the deuce side of the court, into, into that side of the court, by playing three shots there, and always slightly slower until, and uh, Nadal's ready for it, he suddenly does the cross court. He does the cross court once, and then he does it twice, a little harder, so that's sort of blurred, right? And then uh, he notices that Nadal cannot quite get there and is on the wrong foot. And then something interesting happens, which of course is the moment in which the commentator will tell us uh, something interesting too. So here's the point, uh, described from the perspective of sheer presence. Okay, it's interesting because the commentator, all he can do is go, ah, oh! and of course we're like, yeah, <laughs> and this, ah, oh, is the thing, right, that is where it's at, that's where we, you know, we just are uh, transfigured for some momentary um, a time uh, or something, and it's an interesting thing because I have been maintaining a lot during this conference that that, ah, oh, is not just registering nothing, or not just registering something that's so experiential that it lies outside of signification. I'm trying to actually suggest that it is signification par excellence. And if you look at how in history, how this sort of Schopenhauer idea that the sound itself is just vibrant outside of all representation, uh, is quite wrong, but we read it often like little mini Schopenhauerian. So when Howard Dean ran for president back in when he was running against uh, Bush, 
Uh, I think, yeah, oh, no, no, he was running to beat Kerry, right, he, to beat Kerry. Anyway, he was the leading uh, candidate at the time, and he gave a talk, and the microphone was turned on a little too high, and at the end of the talk, he let out a scream of intensity that was then sort of pre-recorded and run as a gif on Fox News, and that intensity eliminated his presidency right there and then, even though he was the leading um, uh, fundraiser and so on and so forth, which may, usually means he would. Okay, so just the sheer acoustic blast was read by the populace as registering some interior, authentic, you cannot possibly be president because I could see like an x-ray into your deep comportment. It is sheer authenticity at work. It was sheer Schopenhauer theory being worked at in the political terrain. And yet, it seems to me, it was doing very precise semiotic work. In other words, it's where semiotics does not account for itself. It's rather, rather than it is somehow the space that cannot be captured by. But it is so, so captured by that it refuses to name its own name. Okay? I'm looking for the signifier again, okay, as you can tell. Um, and that's the same with this moment. We know what he means when he goes, ah, totally. But that's not because it's outside of language or outside of symbol systems or anything. Okay? And so on. So um, this dialectic blurt, as I say, is uh, something to be scrutinized a little bit more closely. Anyway, there's a whole list, you know, Michael Jordan, who can hang in the air in 4-4 time. For five, he gets 5-4, you know? <laughs> we, we all have to be 4-4. Just a, these moments where you have this Jaguar-like character of Usain Bolt, or Maradona, and so on, or Federer, where the laws of physics seem to be cooperating with his sort of the end of his record. Whatever it is, these are the moments that are often drawn out in someone like Umbrecht. And he says, interestingly, there's no ethics there. Okay, no ethics there, because this is not the move. There's nothing there, no convergence between such experience and ethical norms, he says, I quote, and then there's nothing edifying in such moments, no message that we could really learn from them, and this is why I refer to them as moments of intensity and so on. Not, no ethics. It's interesting because I just want to make a quick survey here. Of the three theorists on the table, Gumbrecht and, and then uh, Abate and then um, Masumi, Gumbrecht, no ethics, kind of blank, right, sort of empty. Uh, uh, Abate is going to turn out to give us an ethics of reticence, the wisdom of humility. Don't let the bird of, don't let the lobster pincer of interpretation crush our bird of music and so on and so forth. So sort of stepping back, kind of Buddhist. And then the third one is, of course, Masumi, who's a stepping forward, propulsive, transformative. It is exactly in that moment of incipience that we can imagine radical change. Some, the new emerges only through affect and so on. So we have very different ethics. There's a very uneasy relationship to ethics, and maybe one can say that this intensity produces erratic ethics. I don't know. Uh, but it is noteworthy that our theorists don't agree on that. They do agree on the power of music, and they do agree on the power um, of sport in this, in this sense. Okay. Um, okay, so why might we be drawn to it, says Gumbrecht. Gumbrecht, for Gumbrecht <coughs> if there's no ethics, why do we want it? And then, he gets sort of interesting because it's incoherent. That on the one hand, he'll say things like it transcends the everyday. That sounds like an art, you know, transfiguration of commonplace wants something exciting and so on. The other would be uh, that it's in fact linked to the desire for power and violence, that you block something out like love itself. If you pick up an object of great love, you ignore the rest of the world. It is the most fascist moment and so on. That's a bit, another one, maybe. And then the third one, uh, which is the existential longing for pre-conceptual thingness. I'm just quoting and rushing. Because again, that's the opposite of blocking everything out, is that becoming one with everything and so on. So, not sure, but there it is. That's why we do this, not for ethical reasons, but because of these variable uh, reasons. Okay? Nonetheless, all of the theorists think that there's a certain non-reliable character, a recalcitrance, you cannot produce e e effects of presence uh, just like that. right? Which is fascinating to me, because here I start to think, why are music and sport picked out for special attention by these guys when exactly, in other words, why is it that the most humanly produced artificial things like sport, it's a game, we set up the rules, etc., and art, which is presumably only in the world of humans, I mean, I don't want to get animality and stuff, but these two human, the signifying animal, suddenly producing the sort of radical, least signifying things through it. I mean, that's an interesting weirdness. Okay? So the examples seem all out of line with the argument. Or not, maybe not. But in sport, I mean, in music it's obvious. Like, for sure it can be reliably manufactured. Surely when Whitney Houston slows down two-thirds of the way through the song, and she gives us that silence, and then comes the break, and the half turn up, and then she belts out how she is always going to love you. Okay? Love us. 
surely that is, that is a manufacturing of presence if there ever was any. And it's fairly reliably sort of produced. I don't think people would just show up to a concert if she didn't give us that moment. And it's tough. She has to time it right with hard work, technique. Same with the sport. In fact, Gumbert gets so seduced by the moment in Federer that he thinks the moment is qua moment and forgets that it was in fact in sport of these highly controlled environments where we have, unlike ordinary language, we have a language that is understood down to the millimeter. If the net were this higher, Federer would miss. If the racket were this short, much shorter, if the ball had a different consistency, etc. It's so standardized, it's so everybody's so ultra attuned to the rules that it's the rule governess that sponsors the moment of aviatoricism, which is like, ah, the chance thing happened. But we know it's going to reliably pr produce it, but we need to keep an, 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 an air of hazard and fate, right? Which is the nature of the game in sport, right? And so it's produced in a deeply, it's saturated, permeated by textures of signification. In fact, without them, there would be no experience. Again, a cat would just stare at it and look at it, right? But we need those rules to sponsor, to leverage, to, it doesn't, the drastic, as it were, gains traction on precisely that, which I think uh, is an important uh, first point, uh, first point uh, to make. Okay, what about music? Okay, is music a little different? Um, maybe so, you know, maybe even the Whitney Houston thing, maybe it's because it inverts the usual sort of guitar solo masculine drill that happens two-thirds of the way through the song and instead she pulls and withdraws, becomes a kind of feminine silence or something. Maybe, right? Maybe there's an inversion that has to happen before and that's precisely what produces it. So it's, again, a little bit of... But by the way, with sport, it's a particular kind of miscommunication because the highest achievement in sport is when you miscommunicate. is when you send your opposition that way when you're going there. Okay? It is, in fact, so highly attuned. We all know the rules of the game. The more rules we know, the better. Okay? And so it's, in fact, the opposite in some sense of any sort of open-ended signifying uh, context or anything like that. It is, it is leveraged through the rule governess, the drastic. Okay? But with music, as I say, may be different. Okay? And Karen Abate definitely thinks it is. Now, I'm not going to give you Abate's whole story, but she's basically trying to give us this term called the drastic as against the Gnostic. Gnostic is hermeneutic culture, meaning-driven, and so on and so forth. And the drastic is this exciting thing that, again, is totally unreliable, comes at you unbidden, Okay, it is not. Uh, it does. It cannot be produced. Um, it's also live. There's a techno technophobic uh, uh, dimension here, and it, um, it, it it delivers you into sheer oral presence. And she says the Gnostic often forgets about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is music, and music, qua music, is surely something that is very much less about, oh, Wagner's anti-Semitism. Oh, oh my goodness, that huge music drama starts in E-flat and it stays there for eight. Like, what are we actually achieving through those you know, endless cages of interpretation, those nets full of striation and so on and so forth? Surely the elephant in the room is that we're right outside of that, sort of in some sort of drastic zone. And so she tries to bring back the undomesticated, untamed aspects of music oral presence, the physical sensual dimensions that deliver you to fear and peril, um, the uncanny re resemblances, the alchemies, the crack notes, the hallucinations, the massive deja vu, all these kinds of things that happen in this experience of art. And she's trying to return them. So she gives us um, some examples. And I think we, I, I'm, I prefer to work with examples because the, when you see the theory sort of um, at work, I think we get a better sense of what's going on since we are talking about something that can't be talked about that well. So you. You know, and then we make up words like virtual and incipients and so on. So let's look at some of these. And the first example is from Laurie Anderson. And she said she went to this performance of Happiness, which was shortly after 9-11. She put on, you know, one of her... And in this, she put on spectacles that had microphones on them so that you could hear the physiology of the face, right? And what happened was, at a certain moment, she heard a echoless thud when the teeth came together. Yeah, I won't even try and imitate it for fear of exoticism. But what happened was that it catapulted her out into a recall of the sound of bodies falling off the World Trade Center. Okay, that, that particular sound of a body hitting cement from great height was the same as this echoless that produced through teeth, wired through spectacles. Okay? And this created deep sort of shock and terror in Abate. All right? Now I just want to go to another section here, okay? because surely, surely we're not getting somewhere. Well, let me play you a short section from Animal Stories and let the uh, example speak for itself. 
because this was part of the same show, and there's no footage of the same show, but she used a different example of her dog, Lola Bell. Yeah. That the Lola Bell played a big role in Laurie Anderson's life and so on, and she was walking in California with her dog shortly after, uh, shortly after 9 11, get away from New York, you know. We walked through the Santa Monica Mountains, and the dog is sort of sniffing down, following pathways of scent and so on and so forth, but she finds that it does these sort of relatively predictable half circles, never goes too far, has a certain freedom, but it's like a trout on a line, keeps coming back to her in interesting ways. And so she's just observing the dog, and then suddenly these birds of prey, these vultures, from above, come very dangerously close to Lola Bell, and she shouts up, Lola Bell, and the dog looks up, okay, and realizes that it's in trouble, okay, and I will just, we'll just pick up the story there. And then I saw Lola Bell's face, and she had one of these brand new expressions, and first was the realization that she was prey, and that these birds had come to kill her, and second, was a whole new thought. It was the realization that they can come from the air. I mean, I never thought of that. A whole 180 more degrees that I'm now responsible for. It's not just the stuff down here in the paths, the roots, the trees, and the roads, but all of this too. And the rest of the time we were in the mountains, out in the trails. She just kept looking over her shoulder and uh, kind of trotting along with her head in the air. And she had a whole new gait. Really awkward. Not with her nose to the ground following the smells. But pointing. Straight up. Sniffing. Sampling. Scanning the thin sky. Like there's something wrong with the air. And I thought, where have I seen this look before? And then I realized it was the same look on the faces of my neighbors in New York in the days right after 9-11, when they suddenly realized first that they could come from the air. And second, that it would be that way from now on. It would always be that way. And we <laughs> passed through a door. And we would never be going. a few things about, a few observations about Abate's reading of this situation. The first is that it seems to me that you don't just get rid of the work concept by invoking the drastic. In fact, you kind of need the work concept to be there, um, which directs attention appropriately. In other words, if the person watching this is simply thinking about how much the ticket costs, that's a pretty drastic off the plot. <coughs> But it's kind of irrelevant, right? So you need to have compressed something in order to unleash something, right? And I think that that's a very important moment, that the Gnostic sponsors the drastic technophobia notwithstanding. The reason that Abate was able to have that experience was because she saw the Nordet documentary, which kept those sounds in there. So it wasn't as if it just sort of came ex nihilo. It was produced or sanctioned or underwritten by... Um, this Gnostic um, uh, moment. The second point I want to make is that the, see, the drastic seems to be this sort of moment of sudden transportation. I could call it a catapult, okay? From one place into another, a realization, a synesthetic or whatever. You've moved from one circuit into another and this flash of sort of insight that happens within that. Um, or not insight, but powerfully startling insight. I mean, that was a Freudian slip because Michaelis, uh, the old romantic, described that experience is that, but we could involve others like Burke's sublime suddenness or something. And I'm saying it's quite a romantic view. And the third point I want to say, which is pro probably the most important, is that it's not as drastic as all that. That in fact, being catapulted away from the place 
of teeth and microphones into the space of buildings collapsing and humans sort of in midair is precisely the kind of uncanny reference that Laurie Anderson was looking for. In other words, she got the point. Okay? It was experienced as non-signifying intensity, but it was precisely what was being intended in a significant way. That was repeatedly where she returned, as you see here, even the dog, right? Maybe the dog or her in Santa Monica, that could be construed. But Abate is getting the point. So it's not just that the Gnostic sponsors the drastic a priori, but that the Gnostic recoups, that the drastic recoups the Gnostic a posteriori. In fact, she gets the artwork right. She's accomplished, right? It is as if the Gnostic were lying in wait, coiled up as a pre-personal drastic catapult. The Gnostically attuned <laughs> reflex, I might say. It was her Gnostically attuned reflex like a brilliant music athlete. Okay? Which makes us, of course, return to athletes because athletes are easy. The only reason that Federer's reflex is that quick is through sheer, intense, and endless kind of practice. It is a body technique habituated to, so that it becomes an inner automatism, right? And that is why he can be a split second quicker and defy the laws of physics. So it takes us back, in some sense, to that Gnostic internalization that lies coiled up in wait for the trigger, right? And the sport is a fairly easy one to accomplish, but I feel that the same thing happened here despite the alarming place that that artwork took her. And the case with Hepner, which is her final one, cracking his voice. I mean, the other example she gives is Ben Hepner singing Die Meisters again, the figure of Walter. And he's singing the first prize song. And as he's singing the first prize song, the first version of it, so in other words, three verses to go and three incarnations to go right at the beginning. And he's singing this full of passion. You know, Walter, you know the story. It's about, you know, getting marrying the, the person with the most uh, best accomplished uh, song gets to have air for that song, so a classic story. And what happens is on the first rendition of that song, he cracks his, his voice cracks on the G sharp or whatever it was, huh? And she does this. And that is for her drastic experience. Now, maybe we can say, wow, that one is really off the plot, right? That really, I mean, what's that got to do with the story? Surely, maybe, we, she had to make a quick calculation and say, well, how many do, us still, do we still have to go? Oh, we have to go three verses, three more times, nine more times. Oh my God. And he suddenly became filled with sang Freud and heroism for her as a singer on the stage. And here, even here, I sort of like to almost joke, but I think it's serious. And that is that it's not just that the Gnostic sponsored that, right? She had to calculate, she had to know what a music drama is, and so on and so forth. But that, in fact, that is the plot of the story. It is Walter himself, who's full of passional wayward voicing, that needs to bring this all to a law-governed, sort of sanctioned space before he can get the hand of effort. So in fact, Almost as if she's too attuned, she's too Gnostic, right? Actually, the reflex even then gets ensnared by the very Gnostic landscape that it apparently escapes. So I just want to, again, tune in to what are these moments and what are they really about, okay? And the fact that sports and music are used so often is, I think, symptomatic, okay? And that's it. Maybe Masumi can help us because he is going to go towards neuroscience, okay? The pre, sort of, the pre-everything, right? pre um, the pre-conceptual, the, 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 you know, that which happens in a half second before, and so on and so forth. And this is, the, this is probably our most, uh, the most Deleuzean position. And I don't mean Deleuze, because again, Deleuze is much more interesting in some ways. But he starts with you know, this kind of story. There's a, there's a melting snowman story, but there's this kind of story too. So we'll, just get, we'll let him start it off for us. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on Okay, and yet he did fool us, right? Because he, we voted for him again. And that's the, that's, the, that's the moral of the story of the third example that uh, um, Masumi uses. He uses Reagan. It's a little earlier. Um, and, you know, it's 2002, so he uses Reagan as the reference point, and it comes out in 1995, as I so there it is. But same thing, right? It is the fact that he's this sort of non-signifying thing and is able to fool us into into voting for him again. How does he do it? By non-ideological means, right? By making mistakes, by being jerky, by so on and so forth. And he, see, he uses this interesting sort of psychological test where there are two kinds
kinds of aphasics, global aphasics and tonal aphasics. So there's audiences that are observing Reagan in this case, but you might just substitute Bush, and saying, and, and the one can hear no um, language, no meanings, uh, only hears body language, affect, uh, these sorts of things, right, cadence and so on. And the others, the other aphasics block that all out, and all they can hear is actual meanings. And both thought that the guy was a raving lunatic idiot. Okay? So they made no sense, the sentences were incomplete, etc., etc., etc. And the body language people, um, they claimed that they could not understand any of the expressiveness at all. Okay, so that was somehow non-functioning, <laughs> double dysfunctioning. Okay? And yet it seems that for Masumin, I think he's onto something, that when you were in between these two places, it made perfect sense, right? And he gives us an example of how the sheer potentiality, this incipience that seems to emerge every time somebody makes a mistake, fails at something, it's not Freudian, right? It's now just sheer potentiality that we then envelop that with our own fantasies and say, okay, that's how we want it to be. It can mean anything to anyone, and so it goes, okay? So that's Masumi. Um, he talks about it as a kind of um, half second, okay? This is another part, another experiment he uses. He uses an experiment of a, of a snowman. I'll, I'll just skip over the snowman. We could talk about the snowman, but um, that splits us physiologically. But the missing half second is an interesting one. This is electrodes on the skin, and again, he really does like the skin, that you can register quicker as one thing as opposed to another. You actually experience the pain over the half second later and the electrode, there's a sort of signal. In other words, there's a mismatch between our conscious reporting and our conscious understanding and what happens as a reflex, right? I mean, if you throw a dart at me, I, mean, I was riding a bicycle in a campsite one night and it was black and a kid, 11 years old, came flying into me, right? But all I heard, I heard, Ooh! and it was my own voice that I heard afterwards, right? It was so sudden and so on. So there's sort of timing problems that happen when we're physiological. Um, and he, he Masumi takes from this a kind of um, ethics of radical uh, experimentation, right? That these are the real conditions of emergence because this moment, this split second, this half second, is a kind of unclassifiable, unassumable, never yet felt, felt for less than half a second, I'm quoting. It's felt for the first time again, and so on, right? And I'll quote, the implied ethics of the project is the value attached without foundation with desire only to the multiplication of powers of existence to ever divergent regimes of action and expression. This is kind of a tall order there. It's a transformation. If we think in transformation seriously, we had better look at these pre-personal kind of intensities, right? Affect. Um, and I think that that is interesting and I think it is insightful. But I do invite us uh, yet again to take a look at what is the pre of the pre. Okay, what is the precursor, the dark precursor that comes before Masumi's pre? And I'll just again just show you a short video clip. This is in Iraq, Ban Ki moon, uh, uh, in a, a, a news conference with, um, with uh, Maliki. Yeah, where is, I think it's 2007 or something. Kurz vor dem Angriff lobte der Generalsekretär Vor dem Gebäude riss der Granateinschlag ein 1 Meter groß. Okay, you get the point? I mean, Maliki is like, man. <laughs> and Ban Ki-moon is under the table and being embarrassed and all that. You know, and it's true, you know, that Martin Daughtry's done work on, on post traumatic stress disorder in like uh, uh, um, veterans from Iraq and finds that they're not afraid of the big explosion, they're, they're afraid of like, the tiny sound because that's where they can spatiolocute exactly where the bullet comes from, what kind of bullet it is, what the direction is, all this sort of thing. Okay, but the point here being that the reflexes are, are again highly trained reflexes. We listen to different environments differently. It is not just that they're somehow pre sort of archetypes, right, archetypes that are cognitive and so on and so forth. And I think that's where we need to really be careful because we're dabbling very close in that world now about the, of the cognitive archetypes, especially, and now I'm going back to political economy, which will make, allow me to make my final two points. And the first is especially the degree to which today artificial intelligence, um, software development and biotechnification takes for granted this pre, this half second, and becomes automated and becomes predictive and so on little oracles of predictive text telling us what we think we might be thinking and so on. But the degree to which wearable you know, tech and all of this is doing it is, is actually, uh, is actually um, in some sense, um, informed by cognitive models 
Um, and it provides this tradition with information to forge new amalgams between the body and the machine. And this particular version of the body is radically detemporalized. Right? It is a radically detemporalized one, um, disembodied, rationalist, etc., under the algorithmic control model of experience. So it is in this, last time I was here, I spoke about certain kinds of software and how they incarnate these sublimated cultural values and how, it is, it, 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 how the, the interactive experience, which feels fluid, organic, malleable, web 3.0, etc., is in fact the interaction is also a form of interpolation, right? Or the agency felt when something follows you is in fact also a form of adaptation. So I'm really interested in that sort of neuropower, the move from biopower to neuropower, which again, Masumi is helping um, the developers along rather than the opposite. If we think that is where the, the change needs to be made, or do we need to just bring in the signifier again? Um, but So that's the one side. I want to say Masumi is at once too much and not enough of a nominalist ontologist. And then I want to say he's too much and not enough of an erratic potentialist. So let me explain. Nominalist, right? It is very clear that these sort of um, these kinds of pre-conceptual um, intensities belong very much in the ballpark of the basic givens of neuroscience. They are genetically inscribed, cognitively hardwired, and so on. They are absolutes. Now, notice that when a, when a neuroscientist says something is happening in the brain, he doesn't say, here's the word that I'm using to describe. It's a bare fact. And when a bare fact is there, not a signifier, but a bare fact, it has a strange resemblance to the non-named the non-named total open-endedness, right? These two can cohere, right? So fascism and the totally radically open can cohere if we're not careful about intervening with the signifier, okay? Or something. Where does that struggle take place? Does it take place really at the pre-personal or is it somewhere, is it somewhere else? Um, and I think, let me just move quickly through these. Um, I think, uh, I was gonna show this moment, this is from Hunger Games, I think, what I want to do in final, if he's, if he's right about it being a cognitive, like, preconceptual and so on and so forth, he dabbles very dangerously close to neurosciences and cognitive archetypes, which are often made up. I mean, you see how software designers use these models, it's fascinating. They're really, I mean, it's so beat tracking, for example, beat tracking software now, which is, again, fluid, more malleable, following organic time, not clock time and all of this. The, the theory of the beat that it has is highly, highly, highly constrained. Okay. And in fact, once it becomes put into practice, we then interact with it uh, in, in glitching and interesting ways, and nobody feels it to be an adaptation. It feels like pure agency. Because this is ideology. This is sheer ideology. Software is ideology. It has got the hidden inside. It's got the surface, the screen to be touched and all that. I mean, it is structured like ideology. So where, and it's increasingly automated. Um, I was going to show this moment of Katniss in Hunger Games, but I'll spare you because um, you'll remember when she shot the apple, out of the aristocrats' um, um, table, right up at the top. Does anybody, does everybody know this moment? Okay, let me play. It, okay, because if Masumi is right, and that it is in fact not cognitive and so on, not hardwired, and that I've got that all wrong, and actually the site of sheer incipient potentiality, the virtual, and so on, then I would like to make my final point in relation to subjectivities of capital. Okay, what are financialized? subjects today. And here's this moment at the end of the Hunger Games, which is a classic uh, with the uh, young people. And here's this moment where Katniss, Katniss has to do something. District 12.
So this is the moment that marks a turning point in the film. She proves to these horrible people that she's a much better shot than when they were actively gazing and so on and so forth. And it's usually read, this film is usually read as a kind of rebellion in a dystopian world. It's terrible, class structures are awful, stratified, poor people are stuck, no mobility, nowhere to go, uh, poverty, um, and so on, and gladiatorial, spectatorial ship, right, throwing people into, you know, the mass media, and, and they, they, they duke it out until death. It's a sort of extreme version of what America is, even though it supplements it, puts it in, I don't know what his moustache is, French or something, and a bit British, and whatever, nothing America, right? But it's about America. Um, but that's the usual read, and that she enters as the rebellion because she's tuned into what is right and fair, right? And she's like, you know what? You guys have lost the plot, and here's the right and fair thing. That's the usual read, and I think that's the official read. And I think unofficially, the ex implicit message, the texture of its signifying associations, the sort of more presency type stuff, is exactly the opposite. Okay? It's exactly the opposite of the official read. We enjoy it because she is the emblem of the heroic insider in the age of Web 2.0. She is precisely the contrarian thinker. She breaks the rules. She's the radical entrepreneur in a hyper connected world. She is disaligned from standardized body technique. She totally breaks the rules. And this moment here could have sent her to the guillotine or whatever they used in that futuristic world. But what does it do? It provides great entertainment. He turns around and says, you're a genius. Okay? And she, by breaking the rules, she sets herself firmly in the center of society's greatest success. Okay? And it's this dis-alienated subjectivity this Deleuzean subjectivity, always out the side of the box, never within one system only, always somehow um, hyperbolic, erratic, and so on and so forth. You know, Wall Street calls for people that will not be just good brokers, but who break the rules, change the rules again, create a new financialized instrument, leverage it, you know, so it's opaque value and so on and so forth. The Google complex, mandatory time that you have to just be hanging out and drinking beer and playing ping pong, right, because that's where the ideas happen. So I'm very fascinated about this breaking rules space that is, that by definition is what we do online according to what I was saying earlier, the externalization of the id and so on, as the radically unstandardized subjectivity that is now increasingly required by the systematic functioning of capital. <coughs> In other words, it's not Taylorism anymore, and this is where Marx could not foresee the independence of networks or the autonomy of subjects, where you get on like an athlete onto the, the conveyor belt and you make things happen efficiently. Now, the machine has wrapped itself around you and is registering every shutter and turning it into data points that are, you know, spyware and surveillance and so on, um, delivered up to companies like Experian and Axiom. Which, make, which is where the money is. And it's exactly in the moment that we experience information as being exploded like the stars. This is the new site of the infinite. It's exactly the moment that information has become a two-tiered system in a boring old dialectical way. Those insiders who know what you're doing and the outsiders like us who are playing around in the you know, bananas and the porn. And so now we get an interesting sort of dilemma. This is precisely the unfettered subjectivity. It is the panopticon inside out. It is no longer Foucault. Control society is another thing. No longer Foucault, Panopticon, that we think there might be someone in the tower and we adjust our behavior accordingly because we know we might be being watched. Now we know we are being watched, but we don't behave accordingly. We nonetheless behave like the crazy people that we are. And so it's a very interesting sort of reversal. Foucault is completely gone, completely. It's completely inside out Foucault. And now we have this Deleuzean literalist literally become, we've become the Deleuzean. Right? And the site of the incipients is precisely the, the last vestige of where the money is at. The data points on you is where the money is at. And I'm very really interested in this in, in, in relation to a sort of highly, richly subjective, invisible crowd that feeds, that feeds the increasingly privatized, invisible cloud, right? which is where the lords of the clouds hang out. And very few of them, you know, when WhatsApp sold to... Um, uh, Facebook, this was, you know, four, four new billionaires, thank you very much. Not really great employer, um, and so on and so forth. And so we need to think about this in terms of like a privatization of the libidinal economy. I call it crowd sorcery. It's magic there. Um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of biopolitical production. And maybe, you know, we're thrust into the commons, right? And where, could, one, could one produce a proper commons here? 
Or is this just a sort of communism, like when we do all our good things online, free and so on and so forth? Is this a kind of communism within capitalism? Or maybe a communism of capitalism, or worse, a communism for capitalism? So for me, it's to return back to a simple, more dialectical picture, get some cognitive sort of map that is simplified to be sure, but might make something happen instead of sort of putting our bets on some drastic experience. Yeah, that's it. So. attempt to uh, reduce the richness and excitement of this talk. We have time for a few questions, very few, sadly. So there's certain things, and that, because I cannot get rid of it, is going to keep like haunting the picture. So if, with that in mind, of course it's going to be partial and, and so on, and you know, object-oriented ontologists leave me cold as a rock, because you know, they, they might be right about a thick description of the world, and we might have to speculatively realize something, but um, I'm much more of a strategist caught within certain kinds of systems. And so what is the role, I think, of the pre-personal? Um, and to what extent is that useful? And as all, all the assemblage uh, theorists, because as you say, things are more complex. And the assemblage theorist is more or less sort of substituting causality, because it's too law governance on, with something like capacity. So the cancer smoker, I mean, there's the smoker, right? He may or may not get cancer. Now, he will, he has the capacity for it, okay? But, you know, some people smoke for a long time, and then they're fine. And because some other flow and so on intervened, and it's always a bit like that, and arguably even on the sport field, because I'm kind of blaming that that's unplugged, but it's a little machinically plugged because it might be, you know, some kind of hamstring pull or any of it. It's totally integrated in. And one could make a Deleuzean case for it. I'm like, what happens when we make a Deleuzean case? What are we actually doing? Where is the action? And, and for me, um, you know, I think, I think we're better off elsewhere fully recognizing. We must read this. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, we must know that uh, uh, as a kind of anthropological description, Latour, fine. But as a diagnostic for changing something over here, or there, not very good. Um, so for example, you know, I mean, I work a lot in, in the law, in the intellectual property, that's what I teach, I teach courses in intellectual property, and there, for example, we have a complete systematic concretization, like a synthesizer, Deleuzean synthesizer itself, opportunistic marriage of communalism with, with, with property concepts and authors that appear mystically and then they're, 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 they're debunked and told they're dead by other people and so on and so forth. All of this is working always in the same way. 
Now, in, in other words, who gets to benefit from being in the exchange economy and who has got to be like the gift economy, right? And Africans were always in the gift economy anyway because it's public. And you didn't make it, your tribe did, and there's all this fantasy about how things are made there that is irreducibly different and arguably it's a synthetic synthesizing of all these different things, but, the, but it always works out the same way. And I'm more interested in what are the default? Why is it that you know, three people are getting richer while the rest of us sort of gradually have to slip aside? And I think there, the opportunism of that complexity is what one wants to then say, wait a minute, maybe capitalism is not functioning right. Because if I take a song by Beyonce or anything that you heard, I can say, you know, this comes from Africa and I can show you the sources and so on and so forth. But she's the only, only the author does not get rewarded. Even if I, I, I pretend to believe in the author for a moment, because that's what the system is stuck in for the time being. So I believe in the author for a moment. So here are all these other authors. Only the queen, who did nothing except her company, found all these other authors to assemble in this corporate setting. And then they were suddenly thrust into the commons, you know, like Disney taking everything from Snow White and everything, and then refusing to let you touch that stuff, etc. So what you say, if you're going to be we can say this is sustainable, because we're all becoming Africans now as we produce our free labor. A new class of information um, exchange is becoming gift-like. I don't mean in my salman, I just mean we give it away now, like, like tipping. You know? and, and, and as this happens, it's always sort of, the default seems to be fairly, fairly, fairly similar against, with all this stratification. And I'd like to therefore just draw attention, if we want to have Communism, no problem, you know, automated production cycles and guaranteed income and so on and so forth, then we can all play, okay? But if we don't, then we need to be true capitalists and say, wait a minute, that author over there, that author over there, that author over there, and Beyonce, you just get a small fraction because you were just the deliverer of all these other authors. Then capitalism must be capitalism. In other words, the dialectical position says, here's the form of the thing, authorship gets rewarded for the promotion of the arts or what have you, here's the reality, Form and reality don't fit. Form content don't fit. You know, Hegel, oh my God, this, when I do this, you know, I think I'm pointing to that thing, but the catch is sniffs, you know. And then the bringing those two together into alignment, we say, then be a capitalist. Right now we don't have capitalism or communism. We have a strange sort of commons over there. That is a commons without a commons. It's not generalized. We have authorship and so on over there. Author without author. Again, not like decaf and coffee. But the two require each other for the proper functioning of feudalism. I mean, it is kind of increasingly becoming them. The financialization of these things is so pyramidal as we do all of this interesting Deleuzean stuff. And yet our experience of it is so disaligned from it. Nobody wants to have their cell phone taken away and so on. So this is what disturbs me, and I think it's kind of old-fashioned diagnostic that does some work in one particular forum, right? And I'm thinking the grand explanation of uh, that we find in someone like Graham Harmon or something like that, or Merisu, is fine, and it's super, super interesting, and also something to reckon with, but I don't think it diagnoses that particular problem in a way that is effectively mobilizing, you know, come on, change or something, you know? I think we still need to be fighting over that signifier rather than relying on the erratic character of the pre-personal, even if that's driving us and so on. We must be aware of that, but I'm not sure where the transformation happens, and if we don't need old-style dialectics to maneuver that. So that was an endless answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry to have to draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank Martin and Brian, the most stimulating of afternoons. Thank you both very much. Thank you.